Now, I don't know if you're like me, but I am tempted to think at times that prayer is a waste of time and futile. And I don't know if you've experienced prayer like me, that you say to yourself, I am going to pray. And you get down and you pray, and about 10 minutes later, you kind of go, well, I guess I'm done. I wonder what happened. Well, God wants to challenge our ideas about prayer. And he wants to encourage us to ask and receive from him. Here in chapter 9 of Daniel, Daniel sees a need and then he purposes to pray in order to meet that need. And in his heart and in his mind, he's going to pray until God answers. And he expects God to answer. So we're going to get the next part of Daniel 9 next week where God answers his prayer exceedingly abundantly beyond what Daniel asked for. That's the thing that blows my mind. This thing about prayer, it's not exactly you put 25p of prayer in and you expect to get 25p of answer back, but it doesn't work like that, does it? So you start in this thing about prayer and really we don't know exactly where we're going to end up. But we're going to see this about Daniel, that he prays, we're going to see what he prays for, how he goes about doing that. And see, this is a prayer about Daniel asking God to do something that he was already going to do. And Daniel was basically praying that God would do everything that he wanted to do. So, I'm interested in this chapter. Are you interested? Good. Well, let's read it here in Daniel chapter 9, shall we? It says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. So the first thing we want to notice here is the setting for this prayer. And Daniel tells us what time it was that he prayed. It was the first year of Darius. And you notice that he's a Mede. He was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. This takes place after Daniel chapter 6, chronologically. And you remember that in Daniel chapter 6, it was this big party that Belshazzar, last king of Babylon, threw. While the city was encircled by the armies of the Medes and the Persians, and Belshazzar's attitude was, they can't get in, nothing can happen to us, so we're going to just whoop it up. So a thousand of the princes and the nobles are there, and of course, a hand appears, the handwriting on the wall, nobody can read it, brings in Daniel, says, this is the end for your kingdom. It's going to be turned over to the Medes and the Persians. And that night, Belshazzar was slain, and Darius was made king over the realm. In other words, 
the Babylonian Empire came to an end in Daniel chapter 6. This is the first year of Darius. So this is that somewhere in this time, a transition has taken place. This political entity known as the Babylonian Empire doesn't exist anymore. And the, this empire of the Medes and the Persians is now the dominant political entity. Everybody get that? So, I don't know if Daniel understood the significance of that transition. I think at a certain point, he might have thought, well, okay, kind of like, uh, like Pete Townsend said in his song, Won't Get Fooled Again, you know the who? He says, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. And for Daniel, he's seen transitions of government, and now new guys are in. It's like, okay, he's still in a position of authority. Darius has made him one of three satraps over this Medo-Persian empire. And he's going about his business, and he may not have thought much about the Babylonian empire does not exist anymore. So, I wonder if we see the significance of that. See, he found out, so what? Notice here, in verse 2, he understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet. So evidently, he was reading in Jeremiah the prophet. And to me, I find this so interesting because he's considering Jeremiah as a part of the scriptures, even though they were written during his lifetime. I mean, he's a contemporary of Jeremiah. While Jeremiah was prophesying in Israel before the fall, he, Daniel's in Babylon, and their time periods overlapped. And I don't know about you, but sometimes you have this impression about Scripture that it takes something like 500 years before somebody recognizes, okay, this is the Word of God. But what this shows me is that what Jeremiah wrote was regarded as Scripture basically immediately. This is canon. This is Scripture. I just find that tremendously interesting. So here's Daniel reading the word of God. And he comes across this point that God would exile Israel for 70 years. That's how long this captivity was going to last. The reason for that is every 50 years, there was supposed to be a jubilee in the land where nobody farmed and nobody did anything and the land was su supposed to enjoy its Sabbaths. And I got that wrong. It's every seven years. Keep me on track there. I could read it in your face. Oh, he's got it wrong. Heresy. <laughs> Scared my eyeballs there. Every seven years, the land in which Israel lived was supposed to have a fallow year. And so, because they didn't do that, God says, now, I'm going to kick you out of the land for 70 years so the land enjoys its Sabbaths. And then I'll bring you back. Now, these are some of these scriptures. Jeremiah 25 from verse 11. God says, this whole land will be a desolation and a horror, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then it will be when 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, declares the Lord, for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans. And I will make it an everlasting desolation. I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it. All that is written in this book which Jeremiah has prophesied against all the nations. 
That's one place, Jeremiah 25. Here's another place, Jeremiah 29, verse 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. So those are two places among others in the scriptures where God says, 70 years, you're going to be out of the land. Then he says, I'm going to judge Babylon after 70 years. And I'm going to bring you back into the land after 70 years. Well, here's what Daniel notices. Oh my goodness. God has already visited judgment on Babylon. There is no more Babylon. God's already doing what he said he would do. But then the rest of that is, Israel has to go back to the land. Has that happened yet? And he looks around him and he says, no, nothing has happened. So Daniel says, look, I have to pray about this. I have to start seeking God about, hey, do what you said you were going to do. Now, can you imagine this scenario? That one guy, and he's an old guy, he's probably in his 80s right now, and he realizes, I'm going to pray to God that God is going to restore his people to the land. But just think about the significance, okay? I'm sort of a slave, you know, I'm a high mucky muck, but I'm still a slave, and I'm in the government, and the people are just scattered and dispersed, and they're living their lives as they've been doing for 70 years. Most of them have never been to the land of Israel. They're engaged in their businesses and in their farming and in whatever it is they're doing as they have done for 70 years. That's a long time. So what are the logistics here? How are you going to pull out people from all over the world and bring them back into one place? How are you going to do that? Have you ever done that before? I've never done that. How do you do that? So can you see your difficulty slope kind of go right off the scale? And you're going to do what about it? You're going to get off by yourself and talk to God? And that's going to do it? That's a great idea. You know, just keep thinking about it. So you're going to go off and talk with God and all this stuff is going to happen. What's happening to me? I'm going back to Israel, I, I guess. <laughs> Thank you for appreciating that. Because that's what I thought about. But imagine the things that we're praying about in our own lives. Doesn't it seem about right up there? I'm going to pray an entire nation back to one spot. You almost start thinking, well, if God could make windows in heaven, could such a thing be? But you know, there is a lot at stake here. Because Israel is in, in captivity. They used to be their own nation and a nation chosen by God to be his. 
And there was a place to worship God. Of all the places on the planet, there's one place where you can meet with God and worship him and be accepted and pray. That place doesn't exist anymore. Leveled to the ground, burned, destroyed. So, you know, down along the line, the Messiah is going to come from this people. But they have to be back in their land to do that. So, Daniel sees what's at stake here. The people having their own distinctiveness, not being absorbed and, you know, gradually becoming like everybody else around them. And they need God. They need their own homeland. And in Daniel's mind, this is a bigger thing than all the, well, how's that going to work? Or all the objections you could make. And I think in his mind, he says, God has to do this. So he has something to pray for. God, you have to do what you said you were going to do. We need you. So it says here in verse 3, Then I set my face toward the Lord to make request by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth and ashes. This wasn't a spur of the moment thing and it wasn't this kind of, oh God, you know, you need to do this and got to go now. You know, to Daniel, it meant this is something I'm going to give great attention to and preparation. He set aside time for this. He says, I, I got to keep this open-ended and I'm going to focus my attention on this because I've got to have this. In his mind, it wasn't a, well, it'd be nice to have. I suppose I could do without it. He says, we have got to have this. He prayed in order to get it from God. Like, he wasn't going to take no for an answer. Can you imagine? Isn't that a little, uh, what's the word? I don't know, a nice word. Uh, presumptuous, audacious. Um, snarky isn't quite the right word. I'm stuck with my languages. Use your words, Rob. Who, what? Bold. Bold. There you go. But I mean, this is what he's preparing himself to do. Now, I think the problem facing him is how do you do this? Has anybody ever prayed a prayer like this before? I think maybe when Israel was in captivity at some point, like during the time of the judges, and somebody realizes, you know what? Here we are, we're, we're captive of a Gentile nation, and everything's messed up, and we need God. We need to pray. So I suppose, you know, this was done during that time, but I mean, this has been hundreds and hundreds of years. How do you pray for this? What do you do? How do you start? And so what Daniel does is approach God humbly. He can't come in and say, you know, God, there's a covenant, you know, and you have to. And Moving right along. It's time for you to do something. It's time to wake up. Take your sleeping pill. God gives grace to the humble and he does not even regard the proud. And Daniel doesn't have a leg to stand on. Why should you listen to me, God? I'm part of a group of people who have completely blown you off and we're reaping what we have sown. 
So how do you pray, kind of given that hopelessness? The answer is, you go in humbly. Because God gives grace to the humble. And again, if you go back and look in Judges, whenever they returned to the Lord, it was always humbly. So look what he does. He's giving attention to spiritual things. He does certain things physically, materially. That is, he prays, he supplicates, great, with fasting. And it takes time to fast. That always supposes you're going to go a certain length of time without eating. In the case of some fasting, it could be nothing nice to eat, just bread and water. If you're going to fa fast over a long period of time, the purpose of the fasting is to afflict yourself and to, in a way, mentally feel how dire your situation is. That is, you are praying for a need and you want to feel this need. So you deny yourself and you have more time to pray and you feel that hunger gnawing at you and saying, what are you doing up there? <laughs> But you feel that need, and you want to turn that to the Lord in focus and say, God, I've got a bigger need that's more important than my stomach. And stomach, you and me are going to seek God now for a bigger need. Does that make sense? You realize, OK, look, I can go get something to eat, fill my need. But this is bigger, and I must have this. And he wears sackcloth. This is not very nice clothing like we're all wearing today. It's scritchy and scratchy and it's cheap. And it's not very elegant. It would be like taking a burlap bag and cutting out a little slot for your head. Putting on you know, a hole for your arms and legs and there you are wearing a burlap sack. Is that stylish? Is that ooh, ah? No, it's scratchy. Well, now, why would you do that? What would happen if somebody caught you wearing that? What, all your clothes are in the laundry? <laughs> is that it? Your wife is gone and that's it? You're in trouble? <laughs> A new trend? No, this is to afflict yourself. It's not tailored, and it's scratchy, and it's itchy. Urgh, why are you doing this? Because I'm afflicting myself. There's something more important going on, and that is I must pray, and I must humble myself before God. And then you got ashes. Now look, take a garbage pail and dump it on your head. Ashes aren't cosmetics. You take ashes, something that has been burned completely and is never coming back, and you take that and you... That's right, better wake up. <laughs> now, again, you don't go out wearing this stuff. Oh, Rob, what lovely ashes. <laughs> Going out with the guys, or what do you got going there? <laughs> this is nothing for anybody else. This is you alone with God. Now, does God say, oh, wow, ashes, burlap? I can hear your stomach growling from over here. I mean, does that impress God? These are all outward things, but the, the real purpose of these things is focus is that there's something more important than looking nice, eating. But it's this mourning before God and this, I have a need.
and I'm going to just get as low as I can with grief and mourning. And you know, I believe that Daniel is using this to focus himself. Like you're not going to jump up after 10 minutes and say, I got to go to the store. Or I got to go here, I got to do this. You know how you get those things when you start praying? And all of a sudden it's like, hey, you got to do this. You got to do that. Up, oh, Adam, get you. It's like, what? But this, this is what the devil does. He likes to just distract us and get our minds off of prayer. And so, at least my prayer, I have to work really hard at this. And sometimes I don't get very far, to be honest. I find it really hard. Do you guys find prayer hard? Okay. Now, this is one reason why we do have a prayer evening. Is that we all commit to meet together and we can't jump up and do something because we're praying. See, this is how we kind of work against our natural instincts to not pray. So this is one thing you can do and it's really effective. But, you know, what, what I'm focused on here and what Daniel is focusing on is the fact that he means to obtain what he's asking for. It's not just he's going to pray, but it's prayer with a view towards getting what he needs from God. So he's going to take these steps to focus and be serious about his prayer. So now here's Daniel's prayer from verse 4. He says, And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We've done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us, shame of face as it is this day. To the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them, because of the unfaithfulness with which they, which they have committed against you. O Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing up upon us a great disaster for under the whole heaven such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is this day, we have sinned. We have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins 
and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. And there we leave it. That's what he's praying. So, we can take this apart a little bit. And notice in verse 4 that he's confessing, first of all. He's confessing sin. There's, this is the way you can come into the presence of God. No reason why he should pay attention to arrogant, wicked people. But he, you can confess your sins. He will listen to that. Isn't that interesting? And he addresses God, and he, he basically worships God. And he knows who God is. He's great and awesome. That means he's the most high. God above all other things that want to be known as God, over all kings, all people, everywhere, God is above. And Daniel says about God that he keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him. Now, God is faithful. This is one of the things that is so important about God. Us, we are on, we're off. We're up, we're down. We're there, but then sometimes we just ghost. That's a new verb. Have you heard about that? That's where you were friends with somebody, but for some reason you just kind of, you disappear, you fade without a word. That's what people do in church, too. They just ghost, just, that's it, they're gone. And you ask sometime later, well, where's so-and-so? Oh, they quit going. Oh, really? That's it, boom. No explanation. And see, God isn't like that. God is faithful to a thousand generations, always the same, never a change, always loyal. That's what it is. When you're loyal, you have a commitment to somebody and nothing swerves you. Is it inconvenient? Well, that's no reason to turn. Is it costly? <laughs> well, God pays the cost. Nothing swerves God. When he makes a covenant, he keeps it to a thousand generations. So he's faithful. And there's so much to worship God about this, isn't there? And you could go off on this idea for quite a while. And I'm sure that Daniel did. But you know, that only makes it worse to confess your sin. Because here's God, faithful, never turned away. What does that make us? All the more wicked. We are the opposite of God. We have sinned, committed iniquity. We have rebelled. We've turned aside from your commandments rebelled against your prophets. You know, God sends the prophets to bring the people back to him. If they were with him, he wouldn't send prophets. So the prophets are there to say, you know what? If you obey what God says in his laws, then God doesn't have to judge you. But if you don't turn back, he will judge you according to what is written. And th that's what the prophets said over and over. Decades long, they would prophesy and say, you know what? This is not good. God's going to destroy you according to his word. And so basically what he says then, 
there in verse 12, he has confirmed his words. God says, if you obey me, I will bless you. But if you don't obey me, then I will curse you and make you a cursing. And you can read about this in Leviticus 26. You know, if you don't repent, then I will judge you seven times more. Seven times more. Seven times more. There's more curses than there are blessings. And yet, Daniel says, we didn't listen. We didn't obey. You sent the prophets. We did not listen. So, that makes it even worse, isn't it? Here we are coming to God, the faithful one, and who are we? The unfaithful ones. How lame is that? You notice Daniel is including himself in that? Isn't that amazing? He's one of the few guys in the Bible about which nothing bad is written. And that's outstanding. That's crazy. Abraham sinned, Moses sinned, David sinned. So here's Daniel. He could pray, God, they are so terrible. They're so awful. I pray three times a day, you and me, God. But they stink. Anyway, would you forgive them? But he doesn't. You know why? When you come before God, you have nothing to say to him about how good you are. And Daniel knows this. You know what the difference between a saint and a sinner is? A saint will always justify God and condemn himself. A sinner will always justify himself and condemn God. Do you get the difference? On the outside, there may not be that difference. It may look like, gee, the saint is kind of a crummy guy, and this sinner here is fabulous. But here's the difference in the attitude. The saint is always going to say, Lord, I have no standing before you. You're right, and I'm wrong. And the sinner is going to say, you know what, God? You're wrong, and I'm right. You can't go into God's presence talking about how good you are. It doesn't work. And Daniel knows this. He's, that's why he's not saying, everybody but me, God, because you know I'm on your side. And in fact, you know, I got booted out of the land. It was their fault that I'm here. He just says, you know what? We, including myself. And you notice also, Who's a sinner? Look in verse 8. Our kings. The kings disobeyed God. Kings, leaders, politicians, prime ministers, and presidents are not above the word of God. Like, it applies to the herd, but not to me. I think politicians forget this. They think because they got elected. Word of God does not apply to them. It applies to every single person. So kings, princes and our fathers, all these people who are powerful, worthy of respect, and yet the word of God applies. And nobody can reject the word of God and prosper. Nobody is above the word of God. And Daniel says in verse 12, God has confirmed his words. You know, that makes the Jews something to look at and say there is a God. Because God says, if you obey me, I will bless you. And if you disobey me, I will curse you. And in, this, in both instances, the Jews are the proof of the reality of God. That what God said would happen has happened in both ways. He has both blessed the Jews and he has cursed the Jews. Now in reality, he has both blessed Gentiles and Jews and he has cursed both Gentiles and Jews. And as God says, there is no difference. 
in this respect because everyone's a sinner. Does everybody get me on that? I'm not slamming Jewish people. Some of my best friends are Jewish. But here, he says, you know what? You told us this would happen. You wrote it down. And we ignored it. And you proved that everything you said is true. So look what he says. When he finally gets down to verse 17, he says, hear our prayer. Finally, he's praying about what he wants. And he's clear about it. Hear my prayer for your sake. He says, you know what? It's not really about me, and it's not really about my people. It's really about you, and it's about your glory. Because we are your people. We're called by your name, and we are a reproach. You know what that means? That means the people look down on us and despise us, and we are a byword and a curse word. And ultimately, he says, this reflects upon you. Now, you know, it'd be nice to just get out of the doghouse and not have your name be mud. You know what it's like when you've done something really bad and you realize my reputation is gone and I'm in the doghouse and my name is mud. And you wish you could get out of the shame of it. But there's something bigger at work here. He says, you know what, God, ultimately people are reviling you because of us. And I'm praying right now that you would glorify yourself by saving us. That is, his prayer is something for more than just save us. God, glorify yourself. That's something that God is going to do because he's worthy of glory. Now, you know, there's no doubt that the people will be benefited. If God does all his will, then God's people are going to be benefited. But that's not the end result. The end result is to go back to glory for God. That's the best and the highest thing. God should be glorified in our lives. And when we're living below that standard and when we're a curse word against God, if that's what a Christian is like, well, I don't want to be one then. See, it brings reproach on ourselves and reproach on God. Well, he says, you be glorified. And then he says, in verse 17, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. You know, he's not asking for money. He's not asking for food, cars, houses. Because they need something which is more valuable. And that is God's favor. God's favor brings blessing. And some people would be happy with just the material possessions and the cars and just make, make my job situation work out smooth and just kind of clean up all the rough stuff that I don't like. But he says, no, we've got to have your glory shining down on us because we need you. And then look at the basis for God to answer. Verse 18, N- not because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. Not because we're good, but because you are. You're so good that you listen to the humble. And there is no other basis to come to God on. Not because I'm fabulous, God, but because you are. And then look how bold he is at the end. These are commands. Here. Lord, forgive, act, do. He's actually telling God what to do. There's a certain cheekiness in this, but there's a certain intensity too, is there not? Daniel does not want to quit praying until God does something because this is a need 
And there's no other way. God has to show up. And you know, this is the point where you come to in prayer, where you say, God, please, please, hear, forgive, act. Because this is really about God's glory. Your, your, for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. Ultimately, this is about you. So we know that God's going to answer this because we've read the rest of the chapter. And as I've said earlier, God's going to give Daniel even more than what he prayed for. Don't you think that's interesting? You know that God's hands are not tied by our prayers? And in some way that I don't understand, when we get involved in prayer, God is going to do more, not less. And he says, well, I can't bless you here because you didn't ask me for it. That doesn't work with God. What he wants to do is what he wants to do. All we want to do is pray for what God wants. And if we do that, he is going to answer in greater ways than we can imagine. Who could have guessed what God was going to show Daniel? And I'm sure that Daniel is sitting there with burlap and ashes going, wow, wow. So I think, you know, it's the same with us. Here we think, well, God, I just need this, you know, and God wants to do so much more. As we get involved, as we seek him, he's going to do this. So here's a few things I just want to suggest to you about this thing about prayer. One is, it's about God's glory. Now, you know, his will is good and acceptable and perfect, which means you can't do better. So let's just say I've got this thing I want to pray about, and of course it is huge, but we can say, God, what is your will in this? How are you going to be glorified? And have confidence that he's going to answer. And he knows what he wants to do. Now, you know, a lot of what God wants to do is right there in the Bible. Promises God has made that he wants to fulfill. So you think, okay, well, do it. Why don't you do it? And the answer is, God wants us involved in the process. Now, listen to this from Ezekiel 36. God is talking about everything that he's going to do to bring Israel back to himself. I will do this. I will do this. I will do this. Then he says this. Thus says the Lord God, I will also let the house of Israel inquire of me to do this for them. I will increase their men like a flock. Here's the promise of God laid out. And then he says, I will also let them pray to me about it. That's Ezekiel 36, or chapter 36, verse 37. Now, do you understand that? I think, oh, okay, you've promised. Nothing for me to do. He says, I'm going to let them inquire of me about that. So he wants his people involved in establish his, his work on earth like it is in heaven. Why does he do that? I don't know. But he wants us involved with him. Not passive. So, you know, I can think of some other things where God expects us to pray. Like, Jesus told the disciples, pray until I send upon you the promise of the Father which you heard from me, the Holy Spirit. Now, you know it's the promise of the Father. And yet he says, pray. I would rather that God says, well, you know, Rob needs the Holy Spirit, no doubt about it there. So I'll just do it, the poor, poor guy. But he's, he's saying, you know, what'd you say? Are you talking at all? So he expects me to be involved in the process. Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. 
How about another promise? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and all your household. Well, is all your household saved? Then we have a prayer to pray, God, you said, you said. So, this is what God wants to do so we can pray in confidence. Don't you think that would be fabulous? If you knew that God was going to answer it, isn't that like a no-brainer? All right. Here's another thing. We do not come to God on our own merits. When I come to God, many times, the first thing I think about is, I'm prayerless. I'm sinful. I don't have any right to come to God at all. Now, you know, that's got to be the devil. And I think he knows something that we don't. He knows, uh-oh, when these guys start praying, there go all my works. There goes everything. <laughs> I got to do something here. You're not worthy. That's right, I'm not worthy. You're hungry. Oh, I'm hungry. <laughs> this is futile. Oh, it's futile. So I can only guess that you're laughing because you go through the same things I go through. But doesn't it begin to look like kind of an overblown? Doesn't the devil kind of overplay his hand a little bit? It's like if he's this against prayer, maybe this is the right direction to go. Now, I, I totaled this all up. Daniel is coming, praying as one of a whole group of wicked sinners who ignore God and refuse to listen to him, who rebel and disobey God, and who are cursed and a reproach against God. And he still expects to be heard. <laughs> Man, that means we can all pray. And here's how we pray. First of all, we can say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, in the name of Jesus, and be washed and cleansed. Now there's no problem. But I mean, if God's going to listen to Daniel, then we can come on the basis of Jesus and be heard, and in no other name. Now, everything we want to pray about is for God's glory. So, what does God want? A lot of it's in the Bible. Believe me, a lot of it's right there. And you can say, okay, there is a promise. God, I need wisdom. You said you would give wisdom without reproaching me. So here I am. Or what else? What else do you need? And how bad do you need it? See, if we think, okay, I'm just going to eke along and have this kind of substandard existence and, you know. But Daniel didn't see it that way. He says, God, you have got to shine your face on us. You have got to gather us up together. You have got to get us back to the land. You have got to do this for your name's sake, God. If we seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things are going to be added. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are the Most High. Thank you, Lord, that you want us to pray. And I, I'm so glad we don't have to understand it. But we can do it. Because we want your will to be done on earth like it is in heaven. And we can see all around us, in our nation, in our politics, in our cities, 
in our families, in our own lives. There's things going on, and it's a reproach. So, Lord, it gives us courage to think, okay, this is how you want to work. This is how you want to display your glory and your power and your majesty. Just to listen to little old people like us and young people and people that are not great or mighty but who just humble ourselves. That's what we want to do. And you can wash us and cleanse us and you can lead us to pray. And I want to pray for all of us, Lord, that you would give us that desire, that need to pray. Not, I learned how to pray, but I had to pray. Help us now. Help us to see you be glorified in everything that goes on around us. And Lord, forgive us for our prayerlessness, for giving up, for not focusing. Do a work in our lives. Be glorified in us, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.